My name is Dave Krasinski, and I'm the founder of Heads Up Health, which is a software app to help people very carefully monitor their progress on the ketogenic diet, very specifically to use the data to make sure that we're doing things correctly and that our health is improving. So the session today is the top 10 completely subjective <laughs> keto metrics. And I say completely subjective because when you have tens of thousands of people tracking their health, what I've noticed is that everybody's motivated by different numbers. And for each person, what they measure is unique to them. Some people are very motivated by, motivated by tracking the, the measurements of their body using a tape. Other people very motivated by tracking weight on the scale, blood ketones. I'm not here to tell people what they should or shouldn't track. Whatever gets you engaged in, in your health is what you should be measuring. But I'll go through and review some of the top 10 metrics that I see across all of the people that are using our system to quantify their progress on low carb keto. So we'll just start off by looking at why it's so hard for us to stay healthy, why we're all here working on chronic disease, why we're all here trying to keep the weight off, why we have to do crazy stuff like measure carbohydrates and understand what the heck a glucose ketone index is. It's like, why is it so hard? And it turns out that uh, the odds are, are not stacked in our favor when we, when we really look at the way our society is engineered. And then I want to talk about how we can use technology and data not only to push back against the forces that are working against us, but also to help us become better and to do things with our health that were completely impossible three or four years ago and how the technology lets us measure and do things now that, again, we could simply not even conceive of just a few years ago. Simple technology that's available to every consumer that didn't exist a long time ago, you would need expensive hospital-grade equipment to access, is now available to us. We should use it. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the top metrics that are related to that. So why do I say that, that the odds are not in your favor? Why did I have to build a massive spreadsheet just to keep track of my medical records when I was working on my health? Why was it so hard for me to keep the weight off? Why are the rates of disease continuing to skyrocket? And really, when you look at the way our industry is set up, there are, are food scientists who understand the psychology of reward in our brain better than they do. And they will do fMRI studies on people to see which marketing messages, which emotional triggers, which combinations of food and taste will trigger our brain to have the highest possible reward response. These are machines that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to study the stuff that's going to make us eat the most of it. We don't have $500,000 fMRI machines in our home to help us understand why not to eat that crap. We're just trying to figure out how to stay healthy. But that's what every single one of us as an individual is working against. Billions of dollars spent to make sure that we consume as much of that as possible because they're measured on quarterly profit, not on quarterly blood sugar. If the financial incentives were measured on quarterly HbA1c, we probably would not have the same issues we have today. That's a separate conversation. <laughs> and then our lifestyle. I, I was living in Silicon Valley. One hour commute to work, sit all day at work, drive back down the 101, come home, crash out, go to bed. We're spending more time in a sedentary seated position than we do sleeping now. And then information overload. If you're just starting out, this is really hard. It's a complete radical shift in the way we eat. Even within our keto community, we, we, we often cannot disagree on the right way to do things. So imagine you're a newbie, right? Your head is going to explode, like this poor guy here, trying to figure out how much protein to fat ratio he should eat. <laughs> so that's what we're working against, and, and those are the forces that work against us. And it makes it very hard for us to stay healthy when we're just trying to live a normal lifestyle. But we have technology that we can use. We have technology that's in this human machine. And that's the ability to induce a state of nutritional ketosis. That's like an ancient uh, technology that's available to us that we're learning how to put towards our own particular health. We have fasting, we have meditation. These are things we can do that induce our own biology to heal itself. So I call that biotechnology that we can learn how to use. We have plant technologies, supplementation, CBD oils, psychedelics, which are becoming very popular to help us with psycho-spiritual issues that actually drive some of our behavior towards food, our relationship towards food, the reasons that we may struggle with different uh, compulsive or addictive behaviors. 
and then we have digital health technology, stuff like this that we're going to talk about that is incredible that you can buy for 20 bucks that gives you data that we, we just couldn't even think of a while ago. So that's how we push back. This is my favorite quote. That's why I continue to build this software every single day. It's like you can go get all the information in the world, but unless you test it for yourself and get some data, you really have no idea. And the data is really easy to get. So first starting off with just kind of the core measurement for learning how to adopt a low-carb ketogenic lifestyle is learning how to calculate our macros. The good news is that you don't have to be a PhD data scientist like this guy. It's not that hard. But you do need to understand what your, your basal metabolic rate is, how, much, how many calories do we burn just sitting here, breathing, brushing our teeth. And then we can use that to determine, OK, if I want to lose weight, well, I've, I've got to make sure I'm eating less than that. That's a caloric deficit. Or I want to make sure I'm, I'm gaining weight, putting on muscle, a caloric surplus. We, we have to make sure we understand what those numbers are for our age, our height, our weight, our activity level. There's some simple tools we can use to do this. It is tedious. How many people track their macros every single day? Mr. Feldman. So yeah, it's tedious, but it works. And, and I probably eat the same thing on the days when I track and when I don't track, but the days where I'm consistently tracking, I get better results. Don't ask me why. It's just when you're, when you're, when you're religious about it, you get good outcomes. And so what are the common pitfalls of not tracking? Well, I talk to a lot of users on Heads Up Health, and I ask them, um, if they're tracking their macronutrients and, and they have no idea how many calories they're consuming on a daily basis. They may actually be eating less than 20 or 30 grams of carb, but no concept of the total amount of calories. So not tracking at all. Oftentimes we will overestimate exercise. Hey, the Fitbit said I can go have another thousand calories because uh, of, of some of activity I burned. And we, we will often overestimate that. We may take some indulgences there and inflate that number a little bit. So that's a very common one, you know, guzzling too much fat. If you're trying to maintain 1,700 calories to have a deficit and 500 of those come in the morning coffee, that doesn't leave you a lot for nutrient-dense food in the rest of the day. And then not eating enough. That's what happened to me. When we get into ketosis, it's a really nice appetite suppressant. Oh, I'm not that hungry. I don't need to eat that much. But then you don't end up eating enough. And that can induce stress response of its own on the body. So that's where this foundational method of tracking becomes important. Everyone here has a good handle on that, but just to demystify this a little bit, it's, it's really straightforward. There's a number of calculators out there. If you've never done this before, just to get some baseline data. Height, weight, uh, age, sex, what is your body fat percentage? If you don't know it, there's some estimators. How active are you on a daily basis? Uh, how aggressive do you want to be on a caloric deficit? And uh, how many carbs do you want to target? You can fiddle with this number. And you push calculate, and it'll give you a baseline set of numbers that you can start with. That's it. Really simple. That's calculating macros 101. So for me, those are the numbers I should start with. And then as you become more experienced with keto, you can start to fine tune those numbers and experiment with different approaches and see if it works or not. But that's basically the starting point. And then you just plug it into a nice simple app, and it'll tell you how well you're doing per day. So for those who are not familiar with this, a lot of people come to me and ask me where to start, and they, they've never even measured a single food in an app before. And, well, what the heck is 25 grams of carbs? Uh, so that's where we all need to start. So I, I, I present that one first. The second one is our, is our morning fasted blood sugar, which for me, every day is like my report card. I wake up in the morning, I check that number, it gives me a perfect indication of how well I managed things the day previously my exercise, my diet, and I can bring that number up or down very, very consistently just through certain lifestyle change. So if, if for me personally I had to only rely on one number, it's my blood sugar when I wake up in the morning, I could probably just do keto off that one number because I've been checking it for so long. But that's my personal report card. And it's important to track that not just on a daily basis but also monthly and quarterly and even longer because Chronic disease creeps up over decades. So it's great to say, yeah, I tracked my blood sugar, I lost some weight, but what about over the course of 10 years, 20 years? You know, my fasting blood sugar, if I'm eating a high-carb diet, is 95. And I want to live another 40 years. So I've got to squeeze out a lot of life out of that pancreas. So I want to track this on a regular basis over time. So 
Let's take a closer look at this number. You wake up in the morning, you prick your finger, you check your blood sugar. How many people check fasting blood sugar daily? A good amount, okay. So yeah, I'm about 95. There's some uh, American Diabetes Association recommendations that don't always translate to low-carb keto, but there are some baseline numbers. Okay, I'm at 95, you know, pre-diabetes is 100, okay. Diabetes is 120, and okay, I uh, keep the carbs under 20, 25 grams, and I measured it. That's pretty cool, went down to 90 just with some simple dietary change. Okay, let me do it another day. Wow, I'm down to 85. No medications, just carb restriction, fasting, exercise. So as you check your blood sugar, you'll see these numbers. Oh, wow, crap, it went up that day. What happened? And you learn to calibrate your body just with a simple number, and you're learning metabolic mastery. So that's what I use the fasting glucose number for. Also with weight loss. We want to be able to keep a consistent downward pressure. We don't want it coming up and down every single day. It's, we're putting a quarter in the piggy bank every single day, the weight loss piggy bank, and it takes an extended period of time to do this in a way that's sustainable. But for weight loss, just having a nice consistent downward pressure on the metabolism. And then I also mentioned uh, over the course of decades, I can pull up my fasting glucose over the last 36 months in three seconds and be honest with myself about whether or not this is really my lifestyle that's going to keep me healthy for the next 10 or 20 years. People could probably pull up the 52-week high on their stock very quickly, but how many of us could get the 52-week high on our glucose? Everybody should have that technology, and we don't. Uh, so that's why I want to keep this number over the long term. Postprandial blood sugar. Man, for most of us, if we don't know what we're eating, our blood sugar is a rocket ship after a lot of the food that is passed to us. And not just once, but for some people, and kids, maybe dozens of times per day. This is a NASA liftoff on our blood sugar. And yeah, we have the capability to handle that occasionally, but not 15 10 times a day. That's when we start to wear out. The other thing to keep in mind with postprandial blood sugar is that it's different for everybody. A lot of people have seen this before, but in this study, they actually found that with 800 people, two people could eat the exact same food and have completely different blood sugar responses. It had to do with our age, our sex, our genetics, our body composition. So just because you think something is metabolically safe, it's very wise to test it for yourself. The glycemic index does not just apply universally to everybody. There are even, even the, actually the, the biggest determinant was our microbiome in our gut. It was the largest determining factor of what our blood sugar response would be to a food. How many people associate their gut bacteria with their postprandial blood sugar? That's what they determined in this study here. So that's why we need to test. So postprandial, I love to eat pho, okay? So is there a glycemic index for pho? Probably not. <laughs> what about your favorite comfort foods, right? Does that send you through the roof or not? So I went to eat the pho. I tested my blood sugar before I ate. One hour after, okay, I went to 115, not bad, pretty good jump. You know, below 110 would have been better, but I'll take it. And then I set the timer and tested at two hours. Okay, awesome, I'm on the way back down, happy. Three hour, right back to where I was before. I'm very comfortable eating this, and I'll test it maybe once or twice, and I'll be safe with that. Now, we have a lot of people on Heads Up Health who come to me and say, hey, Dave, you know, I like to have a slice of pizza once in a while. Fine. But at the two hour mark and the three hour mark, the, the rocket ship is still, still climbing. And they had no idea that this was happening. So that's where it becomes very important to test. And they'll email me like, oh, I better not eat that anymore. <laughs> if you're still going off the screen at the three hour mark, don't eat that anymore. Or like what Rob Wolf says in his book, cut the portion in half and try it again. Maybe you can find a portion size that allows you to have that indulgence, but in a way that's a little safer for your metabolism. Uh, so, okay, we got the macros dialed in. We've got our fasting blood sugar coming down. We're not eating foods that are the NASA liftoff. That's good. Now we should start to naturally see the presence of ketones coming in our body. That's part of the magic. And a couple ways you can do that. Typically, they're lowest in the morning. So for me, like a 0.5 in the morning is great. I'll test two or three hours after dinner in the evening. I'm expecting it to be highest. Uh, we talked a lot about controlling food, but we have a lot of other levers here. High intensity exercise. For me, specifically exercise that uses a lot of muscle movements, really depletes the muscle glycogen, works extremely well, and then supplementation. 
I do take keto supplements. I'll take them before I do presentations. I'll take them if I have a headache. We were just talking about this on the way up here. So there are specific use cases for that. And then some fantastic tools. Um, one of them is here. I'm going to talk more about it, the Keto Mojo. And then if you don't like pricking your finger, then you can use the level device, which is breath acetone. They're both downstairs. And then we want to see these numbers start to come up. If you have a blood ketone reading of about 0.5 millimolars, that, that's good. You're getting there. That will correlate roughly to about 8 to 10 parts per million on the level. So go downstairs, go to Mojo, go to level, and do a test. You can do it for free. Just see where you're at and start to see if you're getting towards these numbers. And then we can start to raise these depending on our goals. Obviously, weight loss and nutritional use cases are completely different than epilepsy and cancer and things of that nature. But in general, if we're doing things right, these numbers are going to be present in our body. Uh, so insert shameless plug. <laughs> the first of many. Uh, one thing I noticed was that there, were, there are a lot of blood sugar meters on the market that, that are Bluetooth, which is nice but none of them can also test ketones. So there's really no way to get those ketone numbers into wherever you're keeping the rest of your health data. Uh, so um, I bought Dorian a lot of wine, and uh, we hatched this plan to uh, build a, a, a connected ketone meter, which means that you can actually have all of this stuff here in one place. So this meter is one of the first on the market now. What we want to do is remove the friction for people to track these numbers. If you've got to enter it into the, into the system every single day, it's just an extra step. It's just more friction. So the more we can make this information easy and passive to collect, the more likely it is we'll use it. So we're pleased to say this is one of the first that you can actually electronically synchronize ketones, which we're really excited about to make it easier for people. The way it will work is you just put the Bluetooth connector in here, it will sync with the Keto Mojo app, and then you can shuttle the readings to whichever services Dorian decides to integrate with. And then the, I'll briefly mention the glucose ketone index, really nerdy, deep dive nerdy metric. Uh, and that just looks at the ratio of blood sugar and ketones together. Originally it was developed through some work with, by Dr. Seafried doing brain cancer research, and he found that when those numbers, the ratio was very consistently maintained, patients had better outcomes. So that was actually a better measurement of metabolic pressure than just looking at either glucose or ketones in isolation. Sometimes your blood sugar goes up, but your ketones are still staying elevated. So there's not always that inverse correlation. So a lot of our users in Heads Up Health rely exclusively on this number to manage their metabolism. And uh, just to demystify this one a little bit for you guys, because it is kind of nerdy, all you're really doing is punching in your blood sugar, okay? In this case, it is going to be um, 72, and you can put it in uh, whatever units you use to track blood sugar. And then you put in your blood ketones, 2.6, will automatically calculate this index. So for epileptics and people working on cancer, they're trying to get that number below 1 and keep it below 1. That's like the ideal. Uh, intense ketosis, well, they'll try to keep it below 3. There's a general range for nutritional ketosis, 3 to 9. A lot of our people prefer to use this number rather than those individual numbers, so I bring it up here in the top 10 list at number 5. And then uh, this man right here who needs uh, no introduction, and others in the uh, ketogenic uh, for cancer community will say that even if you don't have cancer, doing a therapeutic fast once or twice a year, where you really put some intense downward pressure on the metabolism, can actually purge precancerous cells in the body. So when asked to further define therapeutic fast, Dom stated, well, it can vary, but generally speaking, achieving and maintaining a glucose ketone index of 1 to 2 for several days was his definition of a fast that can be used as a cancer prevention technique. So again, this is where all of what we're talking about here is being used to help us fight off different types of diseases. And so that's what the, uh, the GKI number is in, a, in the context of cancer. All right, so we calculated our macros, right? We got our blood sugar down. We hit our macro targets. Uh, we even had some ketones on the meter, and we have a GKI 3. I need a smoke. Uh, if you can do that, you are ahead of 99% of the people in the world in terms of understanding how your own metabolism works. And so that's where learning how to use these numbers becomes incredibly powerful. Most people do not know how to interpret and use this information in, in the context of understanding our health, our metabolism, and weight gain. So like, 
just right there, if we don't even talk about the other five, if we can get as many people as possible understanding how to use these tools and these numbers, in my opinion, it's a win. That's why I keep working on Heads Up Health. So end of smoke break. Uh, number six, muscle, right? You can lose a lot of weight, but your, 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 your muscles are still cookie dough. And so, yes, it's incredibly helpful to see your waist circumference come down. And I don't want to take away from the incredible progress that people make on keto. But you still want to go to the gym and build lean muscle mass. Because lean muscle mass will help with insulin sensitivity. It will help us with glucose utilization. It will increase our base metabolic rate. So I would like to see more people in the keto community with guns like that man at the back right there. <laughs> And if you don't believe you can do it, go see Danny's talk, or Robert Sykes, or others. So for me, I, I don't want to just talk about like weight gain. I want to talk about muscle mass, putting on muscle, going to the gym, lifting heavy things, things that build quality muscle mass on our body is like the next level in terms of body recomposition as we go through keto. So uh, Arnie here is really uh, spotting for this individual, and uh, he's getting there. He's trying. And then the next one is sleep. You can have two hours of set, to go to bed two different nights and get seven hours of sleep. And you may say, oh, I, I go to bed at 10, I get up at 6, I'm good, I don't need to track sleep. But there's actually a number of subtleties between two different nights of sleep. And so, for instance, uh, eating a late dinner can have huge impacts on the quality of our sleep. We're still digesting food when we go to bed. Uh, alcohol, you're, you're out like a light, right? Boom, three drinks, love it. Uh, but the sleep is crap. And, and there are ways to actually see, okay, I'm in bed the same amount of net time, but there's huge differences in, in the quality of the sleep. A lot of us, uh, especially if we are uh, overweight, can be suffering from uh, sleep apnea. That runs in my family. My dad went to get the uh, sleep apnea test. They put the 64 electrodes on his body. And after five minutes, they said, sir, we've never seen apnea that bad. You can go home. We don't even need you to stay the night. <laughs> and that runs in my entire family. And so if you're not getting quality sleep, you're disrupted. You're disrupted constantly, sometimes hundreds of times through the night. Uh, quality sleep controls our hunger hormones. And so it controls leptin and ghrelin. So a quality night's sleep helps us regulate our appetite. Uh, sleep deprivation, you, you may notice that it's very hard to control food cravings. And that's part of it. Um, and there are strong correlations between disrupted sleep and obesity and metabolic disease. And that's a really simple thing to check. Just uh, get one of these or any device that you can put on your wrist to track sleep. And uh, you'll see, this is my, this is my own data. Uh, CBD oil, 5-HTP, these are simple things that can vastly improve the quality of sleep. They might work for you, they might not work for me. I have to try them. Uh, late meal. I can, ch I can check this data. It's checking my heart rate through the entire night. So if I've gone to bed and I'm still digesting food, my heart rate is elevated until 4 in the morning. And I'll see it right here. And if I've put my fork down and I'm done eating by 6, my heart rate is at the lowest, right around 12 p.m. That's a strong indication that your body is recovered and ready to go. So that's the difference between two nights of seven hours sleep, one where I'm digesting food until 4 in the morning, and the other where I go to sleep uh, almost in a fasted state, vastly different nights of sleep. Really, really simple information for us to measure, and this is all part of the, the bigger picture in our health. Uh, coming in at number eight, heart rate variability. And so heart rate variability, uh, how many people measure HRV? Small handful, okay. Yeah, it, it's a little uh, less well-known metric, but heart rate variability, simply what it's doing is it's measuring the time between each heartbeat, quite simply. And it's not always exactly one second. There are variations between the beat. The time between each beat, that's just, it's called the RR interval. And there are devices. All you have to do is, is buy a simple chest strap like this one. You can get it for 60 bucks on Amazon. And they are just as good as technology that you used to have to go to the hospital to get on an e EKG machine. So this is available to consumers now for $50. And we can get clinical grade heart rate variability measurements. This is the best indication we have as to the amount of stress that our body is under. It could be stress from exercise. It could be stress emotionally. And we can now, most people think about stress as something that they instinctively feel. 
but nobody thinks that they can quantify it. If you can quantify it, you can improve it. And all you need is a simple device like this. Not only is it as good as this hospital grade stuff, it's better. Because these companies have HRV data now on millions and millions of people. And they can mine this data and they can figure out what works and give these insights back to us as consumers. The hospital EKG technician is not mining samples and giving you insights to your phone about how to improve HRV. We actually have better tools now than the hospital has in terms of measuring and quantifying stress. So if you want more information, just come down to uh, our booth and I'll show you how this works. But uh, it's simple. And we can now measure our stress. People with chronic disease, autoimmune disease, specifically uh, diseases with uh, the, the uh, microbiome, they will have consistently lower HRV on, an, on, a, on a regular basis. That's because their system is under chronic stress. So a couple things I've noticed in my own HRV testing. Again, really, really heavy workout at the gym. Or maybe I had uh, more than two scotch. That seems to be my threshold. <laughs> the next morning, the HRV will plummet. And then after a couple good days of rest, you'll see it come back to the top. When I'm up here, this is my own data, so this is, this is what I actually use. I'm ready to go to the gym and absolutely destroy myself. The heaviest possible squats I can do, I'm ready to go 120%. So that's what I'm looking for in this data. Here I might just go for a light run because I know my body's still in a recovery state. Really simple data to use. And then uh, food, bad night's sleep, uh, all of these things, they can all throw us off. But just like checking your blood sugar, it's, it's not that hard to figure out why the HRV was in the toilet on a specific day. And then you can just calibrate and make some simple changes. Number nine, uh, you know you've reached the pinnacle of your career when you have a slide with poo on it. <laughs> so I can retire now as a happy man. Uh, but on the uh, understanding the health of the microbiome, not something we commonly associate with keto. I mentioned that earlier, that there are very strong correlations between the, 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 the species living in our gut and, and our blood sugar reaction to food. And a lot of chronic disease originates in the gut, leaky gut. These are all conditions that will make it harder for us to succeed on keto. Uh, the simplest thing is just to look in the toilet bowl. Uh, disgusting, but actually extremely insightful. And uh, we've all had the type 1 on keto, don't lie. You just need some more fiber. Uh, there are conventional biomarkers that you can look at that will give you some insights into the microbiome. If you work with a good functional medicine doctor, they'll be able to look at things like your white blood cell count and certain other markers, and that will tip them off that there are issues with the microbiome. And then they'll run other tests, functional tests, organic acids, viome, things like that nature. And they can go deeper and start looking at where the infections might be in the gut. Uh, infections in the microbiome, very closely related to autoimmune disease. And uh, they can start to work on assisting you with that. So I, I put the microbiome at number nine because it's just vitally important. And then number 10 is the blood work. Again, uh, Dave presented on this earlier that uh, there's a small percentage of people that go low carb and, and have what's called, a, they're called hyperresponders, where certain lipid markers go through the roof. How many people know definitively if they are that way or they are not? If you don't have this data, you actually have no idea. Most people who go on keto uh, will see triglycerides come down and HDL come up. That's the normal response. That's like a trig HDL ratio. But if you don't have your data, how do you know if that's happening or not? If it's not, then you might need to get some help from one of the uh, keto doctors out there and figure out what may be preventing you from having that, net, that normal response. Inflammation, HSCRP, uh, hemoglobin A1C, again, just making sure we're, we're keeping uh, the metabolic uh, markers down. Fasting insulin, uh, Amy Berger wrote a post for, uh, for us on that as like one of the most important tests that our doctor is not running. Because once you're getting a diagnosis of type 2, that pretty much means the engine is screwed. But there's a check engine light that comes on many years earlier, and we can look at whether our insulin is actually working overdrive to keep the glucose down. And the nice thing about living here in the United States is you can just order these tests yourself. I think most of us know that already. But I remember going to the doctor and asking for hemoglobin A1C as a preventative test, and they wouldn't run it. Unfortunately, there's no code to bill insurance for prevention, sadly. So they can't run the test. So just go to uh, request a test or private MD labs. 
I had my dad who had really, really high lipid panel numbers and we thought it was metabolic disorder. He just went and ordered a fasting glucose and a fasting insulin and went to lab court and got it done himself. That's easier than fighting with your doctor and dealing with a copay. Or even worse, your doctor orders it and then your insurance decides not to cover it and you get a bill for 50 times what it would have cost you to buy it yourself. I've had that battle many, many times with Blue Cross and you will not win. <laughs> Another shameless plug. If only there was somebody who had put all of this data into one place. <laughs> Some crazy bastard who said, I'm going to integrate all of this stuff. Uh, that's what I'm working on because that's what I needed when I had to work on my health. I needed my blood test results. They were in four different patient portals in the San Francisco Bay Area, each with their own separate login and password. I was working with a functional medicine doctor here in Texas who had no access to any of that information. And I was collecting a lot of valuable information at home. Blood sugar, uh, blood pressure, it was a stress-related thing. So I had to build a spreadsheet. It actually worked pretty good because we could both look at the data together. And so we're basically just glorifying the spreadsheet so that everybody in this room has the numbers they need to be self-directed, self-empowered. And then there's lots of things we can't measure. You know, one is meditation. For many of us who are working with uh, issues related to uh, eating and food, a lot of it is psychological, a lot of it is stress. You may have heard this term, the, the Vipassana diet, which just means like as soon as you start meditating and becoming aware of your body, you start making different food choices, just through that awareness. So the psychological, the psycho-spiritual, the stress aspects of it, you can't really measure that, just do it. And, uh, Compassion and love and um, being with friends and family in this wonderful community and uh, gratitude. So with that, I will express my gratitude to you for your time. Uh, how are we doing for time? Okay. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so... I was lucky enough to get one of these during like their initial Gen 1 release. Does anyone have one of these? Everybody's waiting for them. We've all paid for them. <laughs> They're just not shipping. <laughs> so uh, this happens to be a, a device that you just uh, put on the finger. Finger actually is, is a better spot, it turns out, to measure heart rate, especially when you're tossing and turning during the night, where like a wrist-worn type of device tends to have more movement. So this is actually an extremely snug fit on the finger. And what it's doing is it's measuring every single heartbeat through the entire sleep cycle. So you have that full data. Remember how I said I could see my heart rate data staying elevated till four in the morning when I eat late at night? You see that data because it's measuring the heart rate through the entire sleep cycle. It's also measuring the heart rate variability. So the elapsed time between each beat. And then when you wake up in the morning, you have the HRV score through the entire night which is great because it, you're out cold, so you're not really manipulating in any way. That is like probably the most important number for me is looking at the HRV score through the night. And then it also does a reasonably good job at giving you a breakdown between deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep, and wake time. That's where we can start testing those different interventions, different supplementation, for example, um, doing things like PEMF on, and, and seeing if that improves these numbers. And then you can wear it during the day, and it will also measure physical activity and calorie burn, just like a regular Fitbit would. And then the next one is going to be smaller. This is quite bulky. It was a first-gen product. So the second one is going to be quite smaller. You can wear it 24-7, and it will actually measure heart rate variability throughout the day as well. So if you've been sitting for, like, we're sitting in this room, it will detect that you've been sedentary, and it will do an HRV measurement. So you'll start getting those measurements through the day, you can even start to quantify the changes in heart rate variability from a meditation session. Just seeing that for yourself is like, okay, this actually works. It's very hard to get feedback when you meditate. It's kind of hard to stick with. So getting some data alongside that would be very helpful. So I thought they were actually going to be here. I thought they were on the list at one time. They were. That's why I heard about it. Brian posted in the KetoCon um, Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, so I, this is, you know, this right here, 
the mojo, and this are probably the things I use consistently every single day. Yeah. Oh, uh, do you have, does she have to use the mic? Yeah. The Keto Mojo, uh, I was talking to Dorian about the Keto Mojo and Bluetooth uh, adaptability that, yeah. that he's producing. When that comes out, is, it, is that going to require a premium membership with um, Heads Up Health? Yeah, that's, that's required anyhow after 30 days, unless you signed up in our beta. If you signed up in our beta and your account's working, then you'll, it'll stay working. Well, I, I can't say I've never had to pay for it, so I've, and I've been using it for Yeah, so you won't be charged months, for that then. So. No, all our beta testers are um, grandfathered in, so you won't have to pay for that. Oh, awesome. Cause I, I'll tell you, I love the Heads Up Health uh, tracking Thank you. capability, yeah. and I'm excited to get my aura ring and have that information come in, and I'm excited to get the Keto Mojo Bluetooth so that I can integrate that with the, uh, the tracking capability yeah, as well. Yeah, you know, the less we have to do to get the data is better. Yeah. The more passively we can do it. That's why I think this is great. That's why I think this is great. You don't really have to enter anything or do anything. Yeah. You just get the data. I, I'm, I don't use it as often as I should. I don't get my information loaded as yeah. often as I could because it's painful sometimes yeah, sure. you know, to do all that stuff so the more passive it is. The yeah, this, it is. this, all the meter, the readings are on here. This yeah. will store a thousand readings. So as soon as you plug the Bluetooth in, they'll, they'll all sync. Yeah. And I just want to say lastly, thank you so much for what you're doing yeah. and for your responsiveness and answering questions uh, and for all the help you've yeah. given me. Thank you. Yeah, right here. Thank you, I probably don't need it. <laughs> I saw that you have the Fitbit syncs up with it, which I'm kind of married to sure, for the yeah. Fitbit. So does uh -huh. it suck in all my sleep stuff and yep. my activity? And what about, is there any plan to connect with MetMyFitness? I see uh, you do Strava, but. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure that's, that, that may be in there already, but we pull a very, very limited amount of data from that one. So it, it's not one of our um, more thorough integrations for sure. But the so, Fitbit I'm gonna not. Obviously, I have the Fitbit app, but I'd like to see it all in one place, obviously. Yeah, I think that might be in there already. I'll have okay. to double check and get well, back to you. Yeah, come down to the booth if you can, and we'll talk about that. Yep. Mr. Feldman? Of course. Uh, <laughs> at the risk of... Um, Sounding like a commercial, I just, Dave, I cannot thank you enough for what you're doing right now. Um, I obviously, I am obsessive about tracking, as many of you guys know, but um, truly, I mean, uh, being a software engineer, I can appreciate just how much work you have to put in to be integrated with all of these different partners in order to aggregate yeah. all this data together to make our lives easier. So I just, and I'm, and I'm especially happy that you're partnering up with Dorian on uh, Keto Mojo because I think this is yeah. going to be a major game changer. I hope so. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate so when, when can we expect or do you have any estimates as to when you think we may have the full integration fully rolled out? Uh, it's really just a matter of um, Dorian uh, getting the Bluetooth connectors uh, onto his website for sale. So you'll just have to order this. I don't know how much he's going to charge for it. No, you just have to buy this. Uh, and it, it plugs in right where the test strip goes, right here. That's it. Yep. Uh, Dorian has an app that's coming out soon as well. So first, it'll get pulled into the Keto Mojo app. Uh, I think you're one of our beta testers, uh, and then uh, you can nice. you can choose to punch it to Heads Up Health. I, I will say this, by the way, for everybody else, you don't have to be like a Dave Feldman. You only have to measure a few things. Exactly. But Pick but, the, yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this, even for what little, my dad, he only measures his fasting glucose. Yeah. And no single amount of YouTube videos I've sent him or lectures I've taken him to <laughs> have had a bigger impact than him just seeing the feedback loop. Yeah. The very things you're talking about, like yeah. when he eats a little bit late at night or when he thinks something's keto and it turns out it's not. Yeah. There's just no getting around it. And that's why in engineering we like to say if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of not just measuring, but on top of that, being able to work through software solutions like this that can already integrate, make it that much easier for us to do it. Dave's my nerd brother. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, I'm, I'm like the anti-Dave Feldman. He yeah. measures everything. I measure nothing. Woohoo! Yes. <laughs> Somebody's got to represent the non-measurers. Um, no, but I, I, I think that I want to start measuring certain things because I know that I need to make some changes. And yeah. truth be told, the reason I don't measure is because I don't want to know. Because yeah. I know it's going to force me to make changes that I don't want to make. Yep. But if I want to get the results I want, I have to make those changes. Yeah. That being said, my question for you is about the HRV mm -hmm. monitor because because I've, I've never used one, I have no experience with it. You had your graph and you said, you know, on the days when, when you're doing really well, you're like, that's when I'll go to the gym and I'll crush it. Do you, have you noticed an actual correlation between whatever the monitor tells you and how you actually feel? Like, would you know that that was your hardcore, super awesome day if you didn't have the number? Could, would, was your own body telling you that Some days well? you can feel it, some days, some days you can't, and I think that's where the numbers can help fill in the gaps. It's like if I see that empirical number, um, some days I wake up feeling like crap, like today, because I just had a horrible sleep in my Airbnb last night. But the, the, uh, the, the HRV numbers were, were, were pretty good. And so I'm like, okay, not quite as bad as I thought. And then um, uh, in other days, it's, it's the opposite. So. It's hard to tell, Amy. I, I can't honestly say that it's, it's consistent every single day. There's some days where the HRV numbers are crap, and I still go kill myself in the gym. But I make that conscious decision. And if, if I can just put in a plug, part, partly, you know, shameless plug, for, <laughs> for the blog post that I've written for Heads Up Health and, and for Dave's work and the other Dave's work, that when you track whatever you're tracking, don't freak out over any one measurement by itself. Yes. Look at the trends. Look at the relationships. Don't, you know... It's like, like literally some of the low carbon keto physicians that I know don't really freak out about a fasting blood glucose of 110 or 115. If yeah. what is your insulin? What, what, what else is going on? You know, some people who are non-diabetic have a bit of dawn phenomenon or something that that's really not that big a deal. Don't is it freak made, out. Yeah. Is you know, thing. look at, look at Please trends. Please do not freak just, out. Yeah. Don't freak out. That's the bottom line. Yes. Amy says your health is a mosaic. That's what we... <laughs> And you have to look at everything in context. One more question. So sort of what all three of you have been saying, um, I had a continuous, I was a part of a study, and I had a continuous blood sugar monitor put on me. I'm not diabetic, but it was, uh, it was put on me and for two weeks. And what I noticed is that literally like every 15 minutes in the morning, my blood sugar is a completely, you know, maybe it's the dawn phenomena, but just like to wake up in the morning. And so how does one take a, so I just said, well, fasting blood sugar isn't something I should bother testing because all my other numbers are so, yeah. so do you know what I mean? And that, how does one go, oh, the fasting blood sugar number is an accurate number when today it's 10, 10 high, you know, is it truly related to what I ate, when I ate and all that? Or is it, is it that when it changes every 15 minutes and I haven't done anything but go brush my teeth or take a shower or go to the bathroom. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and because I got the data showing that I didn't do anything. Um, yeah. I know for me personally, it's very consistent. Okay. So I don't experience the same thing. And I think in that particular case, there's obviously more to the story that, that you may want to see if, if you can uncover. I don't have a good answer. I'm not a medical professional, so I, I can't comment. Someone else may have some ideas on well, that. Well, when you're when you're calculating that that um, not home home IR, but the um, insulin, uh, uh, what's the the, the 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 calculation that you do? It's oh, the GKI, yeah, um, glucose glucose index. Yes, yeah. when when your number changes so much, how do you how how is that become an accurate calculation? Do you know what I mean? It's certainly one thing that we have in common is the appreciation of being able to have high frequency of tests. So when you have lots of tests, it keeps you from, from focusing too much on one single marker and in one specific span of time. This is what's neat about doing this is you start to kind of learn patterns, including things that people were telling you that turn out not to apply to you at all. <laughs> and uh, glucose is one of them. You know, I was talking about lean mass hyperresponders. They all almost universally freak out because they see their glucose often, their fasting glucose go up. They like start in like the 70s. This happened to me. Starts in the 70s or 80s and then eventually it peaks its way up into the 90s. I'm not surprised yours is in the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. Is you're, you find that there ends up being more glucose sparing 
how do I know or think that there's glucose sparing? Because the fasting insulin is super low, which is not something you would find with somebody who's much more diabetic, for example. But you only kind of start getting a sense of that, even without knowing about the fasting insulin, because frequent testing of the fasting glucose shows that it's so even keel, which you also wouldn't see in a diabetic, right? So it's the frequency of the testing that makes you start to realize that that variability may not even be that much variability. Yep. So yeah, it may be different from you know whether I went and got my glucose at 20 minutes after I woke up to 40 minutes, maybe I caught the end of the dawn phenomenon. But it's not gonna make a difference of say 40 milligrams per deciliter. <laughs> it's gonna make a difference of like five or 10, and how do I know that? Because I test so frequently. Yep. All right, thank you everyone. Please uh, stop. <laughs>